Good day, Chad. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Guy. You're most welcome. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us about where you grew up and what you liked in school, where you went off to college and what you studied there? Sure, absolutely. So uh, my name is Chad Udell. Uh, I, I manage and uh, operate a company called Float, which we'll get to in just a little bit. But um, when I started out, uh, I had really no very little intentions of getting into learning and performance, learning and development, or whatever we want to call this this uh, this industry that we all participate in. I actually I studied graphic design and uh, art history. Uh, went to school at Bradley University. Go Braves! They're uh, going to be making the NCAA tournament uh, this, this season here for the second time in a row. So kind of happy about that one. And uh, I live uh, in a town just outside of Peoria, Illinois, uh, named Metamora. We're just a small little community. Uh, I think one of the biggest claim to fame for that uh, town is that there was a Lincoln-Douglas debate that took place in the uh, town square many, many moons ago. And it was a circuit court that Lincoln practiced law in uh, when he was around and traveling the country before he made his uh, name famous as a, a president of the United States. So, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah. So, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do with Float. Yeah. Uh, so, Float, we're a small independent uh, software consulting firm. We build applications primarily for business, uh, medium and large size businesses, including Fortune 500. Uh, I like to think that we're kind of small but mighty. Uh, we really do a great job with uh, human centered design as well as building advanced. Uh, mobile software, uh, augmented reality and computer vision, and uh, expanding quite a bit into machine learning and AI-driven applications now, including adaptive learning and uh, some really advanced, cool augmented reality uh, platforms. So a uh, great team of people. Uh, we've been in business since 2010, and I'm just very, very pleased and, and happy with the work that we do, which does win awards at uh, E-Learning Guild's Demo Fest. We've won a numerous awards for ADL's uh, Excellence in Learning for Vendor Solutions, and just really happy with the the team that we've got here. Well, very cool. So let's uh, back up a little bit. So between yeah. college and float, what kind of can you overview for us your uh, career uh, progression? Yeah. So uh, immediately after I got out of school. Uh, I went and I moved up to the Chicagoland area and actually lived uh, downtown, um, uh, worked at rollingstone.com doing web design uh, and really enjoyed that. Uh, as part of my role there at Rolling Stone, I did quite a bit of game work. So we were kind of in the early days of the, of the web, you know, it was the late 90s. Uh, people were looking for ways to make their content more sticky, so we were building a lot of games. I was designing and building games. And then slowly but surely, as I progressed from Rolling Stone and became a, a freelance uh, game designer and developer, it seemed like the content that I was building became more and more educational in nature, uh, building applications and games for uh, PBS, for Nickelodeon, a lot of edutainment-focused uh, things, and then eventually they slid into building solutions that were used as educational kiosks at museums, the Museum of Science and Industry, Field Museum, all the great uh, uh, places in Chicago, Adler Planetarium, built a lot of different software that was running in those types of institutions. And then slowly but surely, e-learning pulls you in. They think, oh, you can build some educational content. Maybe you can help us with this, uh, this crazy specification, SCORM, and get our content to run on an LMS and so on and so forth. And uh, I guess the rest is kind of history at this point now. But uh, once that kind of uh, happened, then we uh, founded Float and focused really on the mobile use case. So good history, a lot of fun stuff built over the years, and uh, really happy to have worked with as many cool brands and, and clients as I have uh, in my time. So you said mobile use cases. So can you uh, share with us, uh, you know, just a couple of those to give people an idea of exactly what uh, what application you had uh, addressed for mobile? Yeah, sure. So um, you know, in the early days of, of Float, uh, when we were just getting things getting things rolling, um, people were looking for ways to you know shrink their their e-learning and, and things like that. And we just decided that was not really going to be the best way. So we started kind of approaching it from a different uh, uh, direction, right? How, how do you access information? How should you access information when you're on the go? And um, once we decided 
you know, in order to kind of reshape content for a performance oriented or a performance support type of solution, um, we thought, well, what would happen if people could actually create their own learning content while they're on the go? And that was one of our first successes uh, in the space when we built the Tapestry application in 2012, which was a, a social user generated content network for, for learning. Um, that was also a really cool early experiment with the experience API. So I've been involved in that specification basically since its inception assisted as a, a co-author of the spec uh, way back in the day as we were working towards ratification for that and have been building in that type of space, I would say, as a heavy kind of big data contributor um, application. We create activity providers at Float. So a lot of the applications that we create fit into a learning ecosystem, generate statements that could be recorded in a learning record store. And, and hopefully um, now as we move into a more mature view of how uh, learning data is gathered, do more of a one-to-one -one correlation between learning and performance. So it's not just about the content that the people consume, but also how does that relate to the jobs that they're doing? And how do we more strongly tie learning interventions and performance interventions to the outcomes that the businesses are actually seeking? hopefully increasing the overall value that the learning and development uh, organization is bringing to the organization overall and being perceived as. Because I think one of the things that we've seen is a diminished overall um, credibility uh, and, and seeing of, of priority and importance for learning and performance. And I think it's uh, vital for us to kind of bring that back into the conversation uh, in order to, I guess, gain some more relevance uh, in this space. So what exactly do you think are some of the causes for the credibility gaps, as you put it? Well, uh, it's, it's tough to talk about this without sounding overly cynical. So I don't want to go too far down the path <laughs> of grinding an axe or anything like that. But okay, I think okay. one of the things that, that we uh, oftentimes uh, lose sight of is that while, yes, we have a passion for learning, and we have a passion for helping people understand the deeper concepts behind uh, what it is that they do and why they do it and what they're expected to do while they're on the job. Many of these folks don't really share that, that same sort of passion. They really just want to get down to business and they want to get their work done. And so when learning becomes too much of that swing to that pendulum and slides away from the concept of just helping people get their jobs done, helping them become the best employee that they can possibly be, then we start to lose sight of, of what our true mission in the organization is. And uh, I, I just think that getting back to the basics of how are you helping someone be more effective at their job is the most important way that you can possibly look at your role in the organization in order to make sure that you're providing the value that the organization is paying you for. Uh, in order to make their overall performance better. So, thank you. No, uh, cheer, cheer, here, here. Um, let, let's shift gears slightly here to your books. Now, I've got you as uh, an author of three books, co-author with a couple of them. But uh, I guess in okay, you've got them all there. All right. So, according to my uh, research, uh, in 2012, you published uh, "Learning Everywhere." Yep. Uh, it, okay, so I got the date right. Good. All right, so tell us a little bit about that book and, uh, you know, wh who's the audience and what will they uh, learn from this? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Learning Everywhere, subtitled How Content Strategy is Transforming Training, is really focused around uh, understanding the, the mobile use case and how content can be re-architected uh, in order to provide maximum effectiveness and value of the content that you may already have. Um, so we provide four different uh, types of content uh, that you should be archetyping your, or architecting your content around. It's uh, content that's brand new for mobile and is uniquely mobile, content that's being repurposed from somewhere else, content that is social, and content that is like really advanced. And so what we're trying to do there is help people understand kind of how to bucketize their content and mm -hmm. maybe focus on specific efforts. You as a content designer might really want to focus on things that are uniquely mobile. Maybe you're more research driven and focused or something along those lines. But we have to realize that somebody is not going to be able to basically just come out of the gate and do them all. So we kind of like set them up as, uh, as bowling pins and knock over one at a time uh, in order to achieve some level of success. So if you are a content designer, I think it'd be valuable to you. I think that if you're a learning strategist and you're helping kind of create the overall structure of how content can reach your mobile learners, uh, it would also be very valuable to it. And the thing that's really heartening to me is when I wrote the book in 2012 and uh, released it, a lot of the content seemed a little bit far-fetched, like it was meant to be a little bit future-facing. 
And I, I am not kidding. Like about, it was about three or four months ago, was on a call with a potential uh, sales lead. They had a use case that they had envisioned. And I said, oh, it's on page 232 of my book. You've got a, a blueprint on how to build that. And I mean, seven years later, the content still has some pretty good relevancy. And I was very, very pleased with that one. So very cool. exciting. Yeah. So in 2014, uh, you came out with uh, Gary Woodall at, at Mastering Mobile Learning Tips and Techniques for Success. Yep. Yep. And so this is on ATD Press. Uh, the other one was a co imprint with Rock Mention ASTD. Uh, and this one here uh, is a little bit of an anthology or a compendium. There's uh, Gary and I operated as the uh, co-editors, also co-authors on there, but there's a number of other articles that were contributed by Float team members. And so we run the gamut here, everything from EPUBs to conceptual uh, discussion about context to how do you design effective UI UX for mobile and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit of recipe based. There's something for everybody in here. There is some strategic thinking, but there's also quite a bit of hands on uh, in it. And this has been pretty successful. It's actually been reprinted um, at ASCD and I still see it out at the, uh, the shows there. And uh, I, I, I just love the cover art on it, too. It's like these circuit boards with all these little learning artifacts in here as well. Um, I've been very lucky to have some great design uh, with the people from Face Out Studio, which is a uh, design studio out in the Pacific Northwest that does great cover art design called Face Out Studio. So uh, super awesome to work with, very collaborative, and super talented designers. Thank you for that shout-out. Uh, let's talk about Shock of the New from uh, 2019. Yeah, so uh, this was uh, the, the last collaboration that uh, Gary and I were able to get up to uh, before he passed away, uh, sadly, last year. And uh, this book is uh, hopefully going to be just as uh, relevant in the next 10 years here as uh, Learning Everywhere has proven to be. Uh, this book here is particularly notable in the sense that it provides a, uh, a framework that you as a learning strategist, you as a practitioner can use to help you um, uh, evaluate new and emerging technologies as they are coming out in order to determine their value or their worth. I think that we've all probably, if we've been working in this for any period of time in this industry, we've all probably been bitten by the technology bug at one point or another where something that we planned didn't quite pan out. It flamed out. I'm looking at you, Second Life, for example. Uh, but, you know, technologies come and go and how do you um, put them and remove the emotion and the kind of shiny object factor away from it and make a, a informed decision on what technologies to employ inside of your organization for research and development, for proof of concept and prototypes, but also for long-term value. Uh, how do you actually bring new types of tools into your office? How do you bring them into your workers' lives and make them valuable parts of their day-to-day? -day? And so that's what Shock of the New does. It's got a, a really cool framework in it called Builds. Um, which helps you move through this in a very practiced fra fashion. And it also has a 30-question uh, rubric that you can use to help you evaluate the technology in your space. And the one thing that I'm, I'm really proud of uh, as well, and this just gives testament to how Gary was such a, a tremendous resource for so many in this industry. So the book itself is a pretty quick read. Uh, total uh, pages, there's 240 or so. And fully 25 pages of that is bibliography and extra resources and research materials. So to, to take something like that when, when it could just be an opinion piece and it just comes out of someone's head and really ground it in all the great materials and literature that's out there in the subject area already, uh, I think shows just how much and how much work really went into that product. And it's a great book. Uh, I'm, I'm only a third of the way through it, and I, uh, it does offer detailed guidance for people who are, uh, as you say, looking uh, at new technologies and uh, it's looking for its kind of in the systems thinking way, its impact overall beyond the you know, very, uh, key stamp. Yeah, and, uh, and I think the thing that, that we have to recognize is that there's just so many new technologies out there. Right. And so people are just overwhelmed because everybody has to do their day job. Right. Make the make the uh, the donuts time to wake the, wake up, make the donuts. Uh -huh. But there's all the things that you're supposed to do next week, next month, next year, next quarter. And if you really want to drive results three, six, 12 months down the road, 
how are you charting a path today in order to make sure that a year or two from now you're just as important and relevant and, and creating great solutions using these forward facing technologies that everybody is so enamored with AR, AI, VR, machine learning, computer vision, all the stuff that's out there that's just amazing that is really reshaping how we get our jobs and, and, and actually do our live, lively uh, you know, just day to day, right? Um, so those things are reshaping so many things about society and work today. How do we evaluate them in a in a logical f format? And so that's why I think it's a tremendously important book. Yes. Let's shift gears a little bit here. Can you share with us uh, about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or HPI, human performance improvement, or how do you refer to it? So yeah. tell us about well, how you talk about this and, you know, where did you first come across this? Yeah, so I, I made mention that, um, you know, my, my work slowly but surely kind of started to slide into this realm of creating e-learning content after doing quite a bit of game and then edutainment-based uh, materials. And I started doing uh, some work here for a, a, a Peoria-based company. Um, which happens to make big yellow tractors. And, uh, and uh, so as we're building a tremendous amount of materials to assist uh, sales and dealer networks with understanding new features of these products and things like that, um, I, I became, I guess, very aware of the, the subtle differences that were being asked of, of me from a, an overall visual communication and design perspective, which is what I was steeped in, into, uh, you know, learning objectives and the, the, the fabled, uh, in this module or in this course, you will learn the following type of thing. And I, I, I wasn't really a huge fan of that from an artificial kind of stilted framework. I just didn't really quite understand exactly um, what that was driving at. And I think that one of the things that I continued to go back to, and I still go back to this well, is that good graphic design at its heart is good information design. Good information design leads to good learning design uh, when used as that kind of pragmatic uh, practice, right? So don't let the emotionality get, get overwhelming. Don't let your, I guess, design sense get ahead of you in the sense of trying to make things overly cute or so on and so forth. Just focus at the matter at hand, which is Am I being clear, concise, and consistent in the message and the content that I'm trying to get out? And that was really kind of my first exposure was building sales and safety training, some client, some compliance, PPE, like all of those types of things that you have to do kind of in order to pay the bills. And I thought that just had to be a better way. And a lot of it really focused around just good, solid information design and good graphic design. So, Excellent. Thank you. Can you uh, share with us uh, who who were your biggest uh, influences, uh, people, articles, or books uh, regarding the work that you do? Who would you credit uh, and point to as a source for other people watching this video? So when I was first getting started and sliding into this space, um, you know, I, I transitioned pretty quickly where, you know, when I was doing a lot of game and flash design, uh, content early influences on me were folks like Hillman Curtis, who's now he was a motion designer, did a lot of stuff with animation and how to effectively get a message across while moving things around on a screen. And I had to be really valuable. But as soon as I started sliding more into the learning space, some of the first things that I was reading were all of you know Dr. Michael Allen's work. Right, I was very much a, a fan of uh, the type of work that they were doing because I felt like, especially in that time, which was like the early mid 2000s, they were doing some really pretty groundbreaking and cool stuff there through Allen Interactions. Um, very quickly, though, I, I became aware of uh, uh, Gary's work, Gary Whittle's work, and the mobile learning edge really kind of took me over the the edge per se to move into this mobile space and kind of give in. Uh, wholeheartedly. In the time since then, you know, there have been a number of other folks that uh, books have been very important to me. Bob Mosher and Con Godfredson's uh, book on performance support, for example, is very, very useful. Still is to me. I point to that very often. 
um, as if people are getting started in the performance support space, it's really good. I feel that if you're brand new to the instructional design game in general, I think Julie Dirksen's book, Design for How People Learn, is a tremendous resource and is super, super valuable. I would highly recommend uh, reading that one. And then Jane Bozer's work has always been uh, really uh, good uh, and, and uh, I think, relevant in terms of social and how do you show your work and how do you provide evidence of your knowledge and so on and so forth. And, and her book is just a beautiful piece, uh, just really, really easy to consume, uh, almost like a coffee table book in, in a lot of regards. I, I have some jealousy uh, in terms of her overall aesthetic of her book. It's really, really well put together. Very cool. Thank you for those. Yeah. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech, now I normally set this up by saying you're at a neighborhood gathering and there's new neighbors there that don't yeah. know you and they come up and they say, Chad, what do you do? Yeah, I, and I get that question a lot, uh, to be quite honest. So, uh, you know, in my earlier days, folks like think like, oh, he's a computer guru. He must know how to fix my printer or my Wi-Fi router or something like that. So I try to get that out of the uh, equation as quickly as possible because I didn't come over to someone's house to set up their Wi-Fi router. Uh, but I, I, I like to say that I, I help manage a company that, uh, that builds applications or apps for businesses. And we're really focused on making employees more capable and able to do their job better and more effectively with better results. So we build apps for businesses. These are apps that, um, say, for example, if we built an application for Pepsi, we don't build the app that you as a consumer download in order to win, like, T-shirts and umbrellas and whatever else they're giving away that summer for the promotions. But we build the applications that somebody that works in their bottling line would use. Or we use the build the application that their delivery trucks would use or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us what your current focus or your next focus is for learning? Sure. I mean, in the in the professional space, during the nine to five here, uh, here at, at, at Float, we are doing a lot of work right now in um, building out pretty, what I would consider uh, advanced solutions that leverage augmented reality or digital visualization uh, it mixed with the real world, but it's all driven with computer vision and machine learning. So it's not just about displaying something based off of flashing a camera at a QR code, but rather understanding the real world, like integrating AR and learning with uh, with um, inventory and order processes and knowing about the real world around them. In addition to that, we're making a, a lot of headway with our uh, micro learning platform, which is called SparkLearn, and we're adding an adaptive learning uh, toolkit inside of there that will help not just uh, deliver content in kind of a regular sequenced view, um, which is very much driven by curated and human interaction, but more of a way to use natural language parsing to um, to actually dole out the content in a spaced and repetition kind of manner in order to progress people through a curriculum in a more uh, intelligent fashion. That's kind of what I'd learn in my day to day. Uh, at home, you know, I'm my one of my bigger hobbies right now is electronic music production. So I'm constantly learning uh, hardware and, and software techniques in order to make new music. And that's actually been really fun because um, uh, it, there's a whole other world of language and parlance and theory and, and everything else. So it kind of keeps my mind, I guess, fresh and excited and ready to delve into technology in a different kind of way. So, mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Is it, uh, shifting gears here, uh, this is about the language in our profession. Is there a favorite or perhaps a not-so-favorite uh, performance improvement or learning and development term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused by people or misconstrued by others, mm -hmm. um, but what do you have uh, regarding uh, a term yeah. or phrase? So something that continually pops up in my mind, uh, and I like to discuss with, with individuals because I don't think it actually gets enough play, so this is almost the flip side of it, is I don't think that we're talking enough about context, mm -hmm. and context with a capital C. So this is a the, the multifaceted aspect of what makes a learner's experience unique and uniquely servable. So it's the concept of understanding the, the time, the setting, and the intent in which people are accessing the content, right? And so these things all are very valuable, especially when users are away from their desk, 
when they're in the flow of activity, we should have a great deal of understanding. And using the sensors and things that are affordances of these mobile devices, we can use those in order to understand quite a bit about the context, the time in which they access the information, where they are when they access the information, the reason for why they're accessing that information, and providing the most relevant, you know, uh, timely and uh, important content to them at that time of need in order to take advantage of that context is something that we should all be striving for in order to um, you know, get people back to their, their flow of their activity as quickly as we can. So, context. Yes, excellent, excellent point, thank you. Let's shift uh, gears again here and uh, the next question revolves around stories of people that uh, perhaps are well known, perhaps not, uh, perhaps you have funny stories or serious stories about people, but in order uh, to humanize some of the people in the profession and or give a shout out to anybody that, uh, that you'd like to in particular here, uh, who, who, what do you have for us? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, I, I get an opportunity to go on the road and speak at a lot of different conferences, um, both the ones that, you know, the, the, the regular suspects, right, the e-learning guild events like DevLearn and Learning Solutions or in the um, early 2010s, like there was mLearnCon or Focus on Learning and Reality360, but also ATDs, Tech Knowledge and things like that. But there's a, a series of conferences that ATD does that I really do love at uh, the learning the community of practice, the learning technologies, Justin Brusino and his area there at ATD put on, and it's called Learn Now. And Learn Now takes place about two, three times a year, depending on the uh, circumstances and, and uh, scheduling. But uh, I, I, I've spoke at Learn Now several times, and because they rotate different topics in, they always rotate different speakers in. So it's a little bit of like a, uh, you know, a, a five card draw in terms of what the topic is going to be and who's going to be there. But in the past, I've spoke with uh, with Bob and Khan, who I mentioned earlier, that wrote the books on, on performance support that are so valuable, uh, with Cami Bean, with Julie and Jane. And it's always just been a really great time. But there was one in particular that was a lot of fun. It was uh, it was delivered in, in Boston. It was a Learn Now event. And I had actually just been in a, a car accident like the week before. So I'm I'm wearing a, a mobility cast and I've got this scooter and I had never met Bob and Khan before. And I come in that day looking just banged up, you know, and uh, it was just hotter than heck. So I've got this hot plastic, you know, insulated boot on my foot and looking like I, you know, just got beat up or something like that because the car accident was, <laughs> was pretty rough. But here I am, they're talking all this awesome stuff about performance support and everything else. And then here, here I am, the little mobile guy. And meanwhile, because I had been in this car accident, I, things had kind of spaced on me. I, I forgot to book my hotel properly. They're staying right there on campus, which is like uh, in Cambridge. And I had to stay at a hotel. It was a hojo uh, by uh, the baseball park. Uh, and it was quite the hotel because it was basically like a layover where people would go after they spent too much time and money and drank a couple too many drinks around the, the, ball, the ball diamond and I'm showing up there all disheveled they're all nice and, and happy and I've got this silly boot having to trek across Boston in cabs and everything with this thing it was just I don't know just a goofy goofy fun time but that was that was that was a pretty pretty good time uh, overall those ATD learn nows have always been fun presented with uh, Jane and Julie at one uh, Cami a couple different times and it's always been it's always been a lot of good times this, the, and they and they rotate those topics so they keep them pretty good and fresh so if they come through your area and they go everywhere like they I've been to one in San Francisco I've been to them in Chicago they've had them down in Dallas and Seattle so Keep an eye out for those conferences because they move around, and because they're kind of small, they're only about 70 or 80 attendees, maybe 100 at the most. You can get very, very one-on-one -on -one with the presenters and the, the people that are writing, and these are all generally people that have written a couple books on the subject area and so on and so forth. So if it's a subject area like game, they're going to get somebody like Carl Kopp to come in. If it's instructional design, um, they're going to get somebody like Julie or Cami to come in, and so it's just a really good uh, event to, to keep track of. Thank you. Chad, yeah. as, uh, let me begin to wrap this up by thanking you for participating with me in this video interview. So as a final question here, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, 
especially people that are new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older. But uh, what guidance would you give to people that uh, are coming into uh, this world of performance improvement? I, I, that's a that's a good question. It's a t- it's a little bit of a tough one to answer because there are so many different aspects to this field. It's it's very very easy to get wound up uh, and focus on on things uh, that could be seen as distractions or um, uh, or what have you. So I think picking up a, a focus area that you want to become specialized in, but keeping yourself broad as well. So I like to be. Think of the, the this skill set or this area as being uh, knowledgeable about a broad area of topics in learning and development. So content, content strategy, instructional design, visual design, learning technologies, the ecosystems, all of those types of things. But then becoming deep in one or two of those items is super, super important. So it's not enough to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. You want to be a jack of all trades and a master of at least a couple. Uh, in order to both increase your overall importance and relevancy uh, and adaptability uh, and ability to talk management, talk strategy, talk technology, et cetera, but also be able to really contribute uh, in specific areas in order to promote and and, uh, and grow your value in the organization that you're walking, working in. So broad, but then deep in a couple areas. Chad, thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom and insights. Have a great day. You too, Guy. Thanks.